People keep asking if I'm back, and I haven't really had an answer. But now, yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. Released in 2014 by Summit Entertainment, and directed by first-time directing duo David Leach and Chad Stahelski, John Wick swiftly distinguished itself from other modest-budget action movies. Through its stylish cinematography, talented stunt work, and simplistically smart world building, John Wick effortlessly blended its story with its action in scenes of visceral yet beautiful performances of violence, and was seen as a renaissance for the genre in Hollywood. Chad Stahelski then took the helm to solo directed sequels to great commercial and critical success, turning a small action movie into a juggernaut action franchise in just three films. So, who is Chad Stahelski? How did his strong directorial debut alongside David Leitch turn into an even stronger streak of subsequent films? To answer this question, we have to go back. <laughs> The year was 1990, and Chad Stahelski was studying at the Eno Santo Academy of Martial Arts. Created by Dan Eno Santo, former training partner and close friend of Bruce Lee. The Eno Santo Academy was quite the hotspot for movie stars and Hollywood stuntmen who would come to train for films. Whilst training, Stahelski would meet and become friends with numerous people, most of which would go on to have a career in filmmaking, such as Richard Cetron, Damon Cara, and perhaps most famously, action movie star and son of Bruce Lee, Brandon Lee. Naturally, Stahelski developed an interest in pursuing a career in action cinema. And during downtime, together with Citroen, Cara, Lee, and others from the Academy, would practice film martial arts techniques using a VHS camera to see what looked good on screen. And me and like two or three other guys from the Academy would get together on Sundays with Brandon and one or two of his friends, and we just hold the camera and go, oh, we can't see anything, step to the left. We'd all get together and try to figure out movie punches and watch old Jackie Chan movies on VHS and try to frame by frame. Zero schooling, just all trial and error. During his pursuit of a career in filmmaking, and after seeking advice from stunt coordinator Jeff Imada, Stahelski found himself working as both an extra and stuntman for several low-budget action movies when he wasn't training at the Academy. Unfortunately, what was to be one of Stahelski's biggest roles so far would come at a harsh cost. The year was 1993. During the filming of The Crow, Brandon Lee, who was becoming one of Hollywood's rising action stars, was struck by a bullet lodged in a prop gun. The gun was later determined not to have been properly safety checked between uses of blank rounds. On March 31st, Lee died. To bring the film to completion, the stunt coordinator Jeff Imada and the producers saw fit to cast Stahelski as Lee's body double for final reshoots. This loss would no doubt act as a lesson for Stahelski on the importance of on-set safety for years to come. Additionally, Lee's impact on the action genre would be echoed in Stahelski's future work, but more on that later. When I take a script and it has the action sequences uh, laid out in the narrative, you know, the exposition of the script, pretty much throw them out. I mean, there's some place that you start when the character walks into the room, and then there's going to be a fight, and at the end of it you have to have fulfilled certain obligations, you know, to fulfill the narrative of the script, right? But 
within that, I mean, it's an open ball game. You know, you can do anything that you can possibly think of. And fight choreography to me is just a fascinating, fascinating enterprise. I mean, you can do, you can do things that are so expressive of character. You can have people express things in the action sequence of a film that maybe they can't express in words in the other sequence of the film. You can really demonstrate some things about the character and continue to do so in a fight scene as opposed to just kind of stopping and turning off the mind for the next two minutes, you know? Fight choreography fascinates me. It just fascinates me. Stahelski, continuing his stunt work, coordinated his first on-screen fight in Bloodsport 2. Quite figured out all the camera angles. We hadn't quite figured out choreography is more like dance and martial arts. So, you know, if you wanted a capoeira fight scene, you'd hire a guy that was actually good at capoeira. If you wanted a trapping fight scene, you'd hire a guy that was good at Jun Fan or Wong Chung. If you wanted, you know, a gymnastic y kind of fight, you'd hire the the gymnast guy. Or if you wanted, you know, jiu jitsu, you'd hire the jiu jitsu guy. So you kind of did it like that. Nowadays, we know we can choreograph anything and teach or cast that and kind of. Choreography is a little different nowadays. He went on to earn his first credited role as fight coordinator in Bloodsport 3. During the process of working as part of the stunt team in numerous mid-90s high-profile movies, such as Alien Resurrection and... Y yep, the Bean movie. Stahelski met and collaborated with David Leach, a fellow stunt performer and coordinator on many of these projects. In 1997, they formed 8711, an action design company with a focus on second unit action direction and stunt performance training and rigging. Additionally, they would utilize previs. For more info on previs, watch my previous video on Gareth Evans, found in the description or the top right corner of your screen. The same year, after receiving a hit from a car for a stunt, Stahelski received a call asking him to audition to be a stunt double for Keanu Reeves in a science fiction movie that would be shooting in Australia the following year. Injured at the time, Stahelski almost turned down the opportunity before being encouraged by his boss, an opportunity he would have no doubt regretted a said sci-fi movie was none other than The Matrix. We're in. The story goes that Stahelski entered the warehouse in California for the audition with blood on his shirt, no doubt from the head injury he was still recovering from that he received in his last stunt. Upon entering the warehouse, Stahelski was introduced to martial arts action legend Young Wu Ping, who quickly requested Stahelski warm up and perform various moves, martial arts forms and choreography for him. This audition was not simply to see if he had the look to double Reeves, but also if he had extensive knowledge of martial arts and the skill set needed for such an action heavy production. Not quite the norm for a Hollywood production at the time. Traditionally, Hollywood movies would hire stunt specialists for specific stunts and rarely hire someone for their martial arts talent. This was something that was almost exclusive to the Hong Kong film scene, but Stahelski realised this movie was different. Not just for hiring such specialist fighting talent, but also because the directors intended to have the cast trained to keep up with stunt performers for all the action sequences, as producer Joel Silver explains. We wanted these action beats so clear and so so well made that they really wanted the actors to spend eight or nine months training to learn how to fight. So they didn't want to cut the stuntmen, they wanted the actors to be able to, the performers to perform these sequences, which had never been done before. And they were very, very clear about that. And, and, and so what they ended up doing is crafting this story, making these guys kill themselves to do what they wanted to do. And they came out with something that really was new. It was new. Several weeks later, to prove he could repeat his moves consistently, Stahelski was called again and asked to audition once more, repeating the same process in front of the same stunt team and producers. Unfortunately, Stahelski would be busy during the intended shooting schedule for Reeves' scenes and had to turn down the job. 
However, due to a spinal injury in which two discs had almost fused together in Reeves' back, the shooting of his scenes was pushed back until the end of the production, which meant Stahelski would be free to take the job. He was later accepted for the role as Keanu Reeves' stunt double. This job would require him to learn all the choreography as Reeves and fill in for action set pieces that the producers deemed too dangerous for Reeves to perform. In short, if you saw Neo crash into something particularly hard and you cannot see his face clearly, it was no doubt Stahelski. Significant importance was placed on Stahelski's ability to remember and repeat stunts without mistake, especially those on wires in which injuries could occur. Unfortunately, no amount of rehearsal could prepare Stahelski for equipment malfunction. During production, Stahelski sustained a significant injury that left him unable to complete his final stunt. Second to last stunt, when he does the, uh, the hit up into the, uh, the ceiling with uh, uh, another stuntman named Paul on my back, we all went up. And then on the way back down, it was about, I think, 28 feet or whatever, uh, the cable system had a small glitch in it. When we came back down, we didn't stop. <laughs> and uh, land on the one knee, and I think his knee broke, and his shoulder tore ligaments his knees, dislocated his shoulders, broke some ribs. As an apology, the directors Andy and Larry Wachowski invited him to observe the editing process for the film. He would observe the work of Zack Steinberg, who would later go on to win an Oscar for his work on The Matrix. Stahelski took note that the movie was being edited during a significant transitional period in Hollywood, in which a lot of producers were moving from analogue to digital editing and began to develop an interest in the process. Whilst recovering from the injury, Stahelski saw fit to buy a computer with digital editing software using the money he earned from the Matrix, and began learning the process. He would become one of many in a new generation of consumers with access to this new digital editing software, which would later become the norm. After all, this video has been edited using Adobe software. Where we go from there this is a choice I leave to you. After his recovery, word of a trilogy for the Matrix franchise was spreading, with the creation of his second and third film planned to take place in a single production from start to finish. Stahelski was brought on to be the stunt coordinator for all of the martial arts sequences in both films. Hi, you fellas. It's him. The anomaly. Do we proceed? Yes. He is still only human. <laughs> This would not only be the hardest work of his career so far, but perhaps one of the most ambitious film productions of all time, with some of the largest sets and most complicated visual effects work of any Hollywood production to date.
When the two scripts came in, Reloaded and Revolutions, it became very clear that it was just one movie that was just cut in half. And it was made as one movie. No one's ever tried any of this stuff before. Well, how do you schedule it? It's never been done. Nobody's ever worked on this scale. This exponential, not similar, but exponential <laughs> level of complexity. Pre-produce for a year, we're going to shoot for a year, and we'll have a year of post-production. It's a military exercise in, in getting all this together. We've got you know upwards of 150 to 180 sets, depending on how you how you actually sort of count them. Well, the, the trick was we you know we read the second script, and you could tell even then that it was. Oh, enormous, but that side we'd signed our contracts. Furthermore, he would use this opportunity to work with David Leitch once again in the Chateau fight sequence, among other famous stunt performers such as Tiger Chen. Stahelski would go on to characterise his work on the three films as the Wachowski Gauntlet for its difficulty and enormous production schedule, with his time involved in the second and third films being roughly 22 months. Moreover, and perhaps most importantly though, Reeves and Stahelski would remark at how much of a learning experience being put through the Wachowski gauntlet was for them. The Wachowski Film School. Yeah. I think the world building was something you can't help, like how to make action beautiful, how to expand worlds or create this reality from the smallest prop to the biggest set piece to, to lighting to the fact that the action is a story, the story is the action, it doesn't stop. How to continue through and develop your character through that. Like you get to know Neo by the way he fights, not just by the way he talks or stands or anything like that. It's a big part of his character. And I think that stayed with us. I mean, they're so, such influential filmmakers and their attention to detail and the depth of which they go and the meaning behind everything from the color of the set to the wardrobe to the way that the, the characters perform was absolutely I think you're cool. lensing and framing too because the Wachowskis yeah. were very influenced by Japanese, Hong Kong cinema, absolutely. Um, Italian cinema. You know. Oh yeah, the framing and composition, the way we jump out and let the, let the camera tell a lot of the story. Their editing style, I think, is fairly symmetrical, the wide thing. They're not trying to rush anything, they're trying to just let you witness the story and experience it and suck you into the world rather than rush you through anything. Uh, again, I, I think the influences are pretty massive, <laughs> like, you know. But you have your own flavor now, too, sir. I, Wachowski light. For example, when working on such sequences as the Barely Brawl, close collaboration with the visual effects supervisor was needed, as the scene aimed to transition seamlessly between live action and computer generated imagery during the fight, something that had not been done to such a scale or in such detail before. We start with stunt doubles and somewhat conservative Hong Kong style lock offs and quick cuts everywhere. Then as we get to the second act where there's 25 men, there'll be like a mixture of CG Smiths and head replacements and, and doubles going on all at the same time. In the third act, where there's up to 80 men, these, this will be all virtual, all computer graphics, including Neo. This would not only be for The Matrix Reloaded, but for the final fight sequence of The Matrix Revolutions. After the production wrapped, Stahelski spent more time collaborating with David Leitch to further establish 8711 action design and turn it into a recognisable name in the business. The two produced action and coordinated stunts for such high profile films as 300, Rambo, and even had the chance to work with their old friend Keanu Reeves again on the set of Constantine, in which Stahelski would double for him once more. Additionally, Stahelski would continue work with Larry and Andy Wachowski on films such as V for Vendetta, written and produced by the brothers, as well as on their Speed Race adaptation. <laughs> Speed Race 
Speed Racer perhaps presented itself as the most challenging work since the Matrix trilogy for Stahelski, as the directors were once again attempting to push the boundaries of visual effects with experimental and untested ideas and camera techniques. During the production of Speed Racer, Stahelski remarked to the directors that Rain, actor for the character Tejo Togo Khan, had a strong background and understanding of martial arts and choreography, and that the two should consider him for future projects. Upon being asked by the two what kind of movie they'd always wanted to work on, Leech and Stahelski both agreed on something with ninjas. After further discussion, Larry and Andy tasked a team with writing a script for a low-budget action movie with ninjas, and asked their close friend James McTeague to direct. Ninja Assassin would shoot in Berlin and have Rain as the lead actor, with Stahelski and Leech being given the role as second unit directors for the first time and handed large creative control over the action. This would kickstart their continued success as second unit action directors as well as their ongoing stunt coordination work. However, the two still felt unsatisfied, yearning for even more creative control over the action. There are times where we're just brought in to literally get a bunch of cool shit and hand it off. I can shoot and choreograph what I think is a Picasso of action, and it's still up to the director and you know studio and producers how that comes together. We've handed in something that could be edited very well. A lot can still go wrong. And, you know, that's unfortunately the majority rather than the minority. One element that Stahelski felt particularly passionate about was having the actors trained to perform various action beats in scenes and sequences, something not all directors and producers would agree to, nor schedule enough time to do well. It's mostly because they come in and they think, oh, well, Chad's the action guy, or Bob's the action guy, or Scott's the action So I'm just going to go eat lunch. That's the worst attitude you can have. How many movies have you recently watched? where it just becomes a gunfighter, just becomes a fight scene, and it's the obligatory third act, I gotta beat up the giant robot. But you don't really feel anything, you don't care, you don't really see the actor's face because he's in a suit, a hood, or a mask. That's because it wasn't shot by the director, that's because the cast wasn't even on set. That was the second unit guys trying to get it done with what first unit gave them. His reasoning for being so invested in this concept is that he felt actors being trained for action meant shortcuts would not need to be taken during a production, and thus produce better action. He felt that with a trained cast member, the need to cover up for bad action drastically goes down. The need for a stunt double is reduced. The connection to the character being played by the actor is increased, and overall, more creative freedom can be had on a production. With this increased creative freedom, the focus can once again be placed on what is the best choice for a scene, and not how to cover up for a bad performance. Believability in the character. When you see a character in mode, it's the same thing. When you really see Christian Bale cry, it's really Christian Bale crying, like you, you, you get on board with that. What if you just saw the back of his head crying? You don't really care, right? It sounds silly, but that's what you're doing with action. If you see the guy doing his own action, that's great. How many of you guys have seen in action movies the scene where the two FBI guys, the CIA guys, open the folder and go, Joe, he was the Navy SEALs, he was the three tours, in like he'd tell you how badass he is. But do you ever see him do anything badass? <laughs> Not really. I am sure we all have examples in our head of when an action scene is shot and edited in such a way to the point it is impossible to tell exactly what is happening. This is rarely an artistic choice. In short, Stahelski and Leech began waiting for an opportunity to solo direct an action movie with a committed cast member and the right script. Eventually, after working with Keanu Reeves again on his directorial debut, Man of Tai Chi, Reeves would present this opportunity to them. Unbeknownst to Stahelski and Leach, Reeves had been in contact with writer Derek Kolstad and producer for Thunder Road Pictures Basil Iwanak. 
Kolstad had been working on an action script titled Scorn, and Iwanak was looking for second unit directors to handle the action alongside a main unit director. Reeves recommended Leach and Stahelski, and Iwanak approached the two to gauge their interest. But in the back of my mind, I thought that it would be to their taste. So I didn't know how that was going to go, but I kind of presented it. I got the script on a Friday, read it, called Dave on a Saturday. Chad and I talked about it, and we're like, man, this is like three quarters action anyway. Maybe this is um, a good one to direct. We got on the phone with Keanu and said, look, we'd like to direct your movie, or at least bid for the, the directing job on it. And he was like ecstatic. He was excited about that. And I was like, yes. Within four days, the movie had been proposed and was quickly heading into pre-production. Furthermore, Stahelski and Leach wanted to train Reeves, and with his background in the Matrix, the two knew the kind of training they had planned would be something Reeves was capable of. Fifteen weeks of heavy choreography practice five days a week is a lot for most actors, but as Stahelski would put it, Reeves would handle it without a single complaint. Keanu went through extensive training, uh, probably four solid months. And I don't mean like an hour a day you know, doing push-ups and sit-ups. I mean, five days a week, eight hours a day. Gun training, martial arts training, driving training. He's always first man there, last man to leave, and when it's time to hit the gym or hit a specific skill set, he's always there. He's always been incredibly involved, and he wants to be there. He carved out his entire summer to become John Wick. At least in the movies I've worked on as a producer, I've never seen a movie star give so much commitment of his time before a movie actually started. And that training has paid off because the, the stuff he's doing in this movie is just incredible. Within no time, the movie was shaking up to be a success on release, earning a staggering $86 million worldwide. Roughly four times its purported production budget, with the producer noting its subversive and fun turn. After the movie's success, David Leitch would step back from the directorial role for the film's sequels. This would leave Stahelski in the position as the movie's lead creative driving force. The question now was how to add to such a franchise organically. Stahelski considered himself to be a fanboy of the first film and wanted to recreate the same tone whilst developing on top of its well building and action foundations. To do this, he looked toward implementing ideas from films and filmmakers that inspired him. These would include Jackie Chan. Sergio Leone. Kira Kurosawa. Steve McQueen. Naturally, the Wachowskis. That's a miracle. Guns. Lots of guns. What do you need? Guns. Lots of guns. And finally, if there was one filmmaker which had the greatest influence on Stahelski and modern action as a whole, it would be Buster Keaton. 
This inspiration can not just be seen in Stahelski's numerous visual references to Keaton's films in the John Wick series. Action! or even the sequences homaging Keaton's more famous stunts. All right. But instead, this inspiration can be seen in his storytelling philosophy. We never even thought of writing a script. We didn't need to. But we eliminated subtitles just as fast as we could if we could possibly tell it in action. A lot of it is an open development. We don't write the script first. In the script it says knife fight. It's all antique knife fight. Every action movie you've ever seen, hero picks up a knife, he throws it, what happens? Dead nuts, sticks right on. Okay, we're like, eh, that's never happened to us. So what do you say, John? What just misses a lot. All right, snowball fight with knives. And that was the, the brief to the stunt team. <laughs> To Stahelski, action is a tool for telling a story and should be used appropriately. In creating action scenes, Stahelski and his stunt team often came up with ideas for a scene and considered not only the logistics of said idea, such as how to train dogs to perform choreography simultaneously to an actor, but also what the action may say about the character. This is why action and scripting is something Stahelski plans at the same time alongside Derek Kolstad. That's directing. Sure. If you're going to do a movie about, you know, horse racing, learn about horse racing. You're going to do a movie about boxing, learn about boxing. Don't divide it up. Storytelling right. is storytelling. That's a Hollywood thing now. Action, story. They're split right down the line. But I bet you any action movie that you love does not have that division. Without understanding the implications a character's actions may have on the story, and what it may say about them, said actions could contradict their overall motivations, leading to inconsistent and unsatisfying stories. For example, if we were to look at Transformers Age of Extinction. Specifically during a scene in which Optimus Prime has just freed slaves from the captivity of the movie's villains. In this scene, Optimus attempts to convince the former slaves to fight by his side to eliminate a common threat. To do this, he chooses to attack, threaten, and essentially force them into fighting for him. Only together can we survive! In essence, Optimus has taken them into his own form of slavery to accomplish his goals. From an action standpoint, it would seem he is no better than the villains. However, the staging of the scene heroic music, and dialogue from both Optimus and his allies suggest that what he is doing is somehow noble and good. We must join forces, or else forever be their slaves. So today you stand with us, or you stand against me. We're giving you freedom! You defend my family, or die. You just want to die for the guy. That's leadership. No. That's Optimus Prime. Optimus Prime is not the best role model. Anyways, where were we? When planning action and scripting side by side, as well as having a significant understanding of characters and what they want, a story can achieve the opposite, and turn something as simple as a character's choice to do something into an emotionally impactful moment for the audience. To prove Stahelski's understanding of this, let's observe the opening action sequence to John Wick Chapter 2. But first, context. In the first John Wick, retired assassin John goes on a vengeance-filled mission to kill Iosef, the son of Russian mobster Vigo, for killing the dog gifted to him by his late wife Helen, and robbing him of his chance to grieve. This leads to Vigo, in turn, attempting to kill John Wick. Where is he? Shit! The movie ending with the death of Vigo. Ah! 
By all accounts, John's mission is over, and he can return to his life as a retired assassin, never to kill again. However, the opening of the sequel sees John tracking down his car that had previously been stolen by Yosef and attacking more of the mobsters. <laughs> On the outside, this appears out of character to what John wanted in the first film, and in some ways even petty. Why would John kill all these people just to get his car back? That is, until we see John is refusing to kill any of his combatants, with the only use of his gun being to incapacitate his final foe. So you're probably thinking, this is entirely contradictory to John's actions in the first film, in which he almost without mercy, efficiently, and uncaringly kills many people to get to Yosef. And you would be right, if not for the following conversation. Mir. The good trier hoj yet beaten yet Pridila. That's right, this was simply John's way of brokering peace. In the end of the first film, it seems apparent John was once again done with killing, his mission over, his task complete, and this stays consistent in both the writing and John's actions in the second film. The added benefit of action being used in such a way to add to the story is not just that we get to see a character's choice or care, but also the immediate ramifications said choice has on both the character that made the choice and the wider universe they inhabit in the story. To sum up, actions have consequences, and Stahelski shows the audience these consequences. This is why when John Wick does this... Yeah, Jonathan. Walk away. What have you done? Finished it. The audience is shocked as they have already seen the grim consequences of such an action befall a character before. However, it takes more than just well-planned choreography and scripting to pull off such impressive action on screen. More practical problems need to be solved too, such as that of effects work. Compared to most big budget movies, the visual effects work in the John Wick franchise may seem meagre. When looking more closely, it can be seen that that is not entirely true. Did you know the glass in this scene is computer generated? And the knives? And this axe. The question you may be asking is, why? Why are so many of these elements not real? This answer perhaps most likely comes from Stahelski's experience with the Wachowskis through the years, and their effects heavy, high concept films. The answer is simple to him, because a fluid, unbroken performance from the actors is far more believable than a realistic knife prop, or in this scene in particular, a real road. What makes these practical problems? because having actors interacting on a real road, crashing real motorcycles, is harder to film from a practical standpoint. Not to mention, dangerous. The more elements you put into a sequence, knives, props, guns, reloads, breakaways, the more chances you have of uh, failure or problems where you have to keep redoing takes. Stahelski considers these necessary sacrifices to allow the professionals freedom to work. The added visual effects in post-production is just another tool he's using to make a scene believable. You get the right VFX guys and the right VFX supervisor who understands quality and subtlety. I'm pretty tight with a lot of the VFX guys and a lot of my friends who are like, okay, let's, again, we know the problems. Okay, where's the magical combination between us, practical effects, and VFX?
Nevertheless, this is not all that is required to push the scene into the realm of believability. This is where the idea of audience suspension of disbelief comes into practice. From a filmmaking perspective, most audience members already enter into a movie with the expectation that it is not real life. With this idea in mind, filmmakers can make caveats, using film language to convince the audience that something can happen in a film, even if it cannot happen in real life. This brings into focus the idea that something can be believable without being realistic, if you construct the idea in the audience's mind beforehand. For example, John Wick Chapter 2 takes the time to tell you John's suit is bulletproof, so as a viewer, you take this into consideration in future scenes when John survives an ambush by several gunmen. Stahelski sometimes takes this one step further, using pre-established film language to poke fun at regular convention. Such as in this scene, in which John and Cassian quietly engage in stealthy combat in a crowded public space using pistols with suppressors. From a realistic perspective, everyone would notice, as real-world suppressors are not nearly this quiet nor are guns this hard to spot. But in movie fiction, a suppressor is code for silent gun, so Stahelski uses this filmmaking language to push right onto the boundaries of believability, to add levity to a tense third act. But they still don't kind of really notice him, and I think this is... You almost go to the extreme here in this sequence. Yep. All the extras are walking one direction. Like no one's turning around. Nope. <laughs> Not in John Wick will. Well, you ever, you've been in New York. <laughs> we could have a gunfight in New York. I don't think anybody would turn around anyways. Guy's just getting shot on the platform. Eh, the train's just going to take off. It's okay. The secret to John Wick action. Start with a funny thing and end with a funny thing in the middle. <laughs> right. Be as ruthless as you can. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think we have comedy through, uh, through violence. This comes with the added benefit of keeping the audience engaged and always trying to guess what will happen next. With all this in mind, it is not hard to see why the franchise contributed to a renaissance for the action genre, and why each film has gone from strength to strength. Overall, this series represents a coherent blend of well-written characters, well-executed choreography, seamless effects work and creative subversion of action conventions. And that is why Stahelski and his team make John Wick stand tall as a masterclass in action storytelling. Who do you wish to die as? The Baba Yaga? The last thing many men ever see? Or as a man who loved and was loved by his wife? I love you, John. Die! John Wick. Tell me. Tell them all. Whoever comes, whoever it is, I'll kill them. I'll kill them all. You pissed John. Are huh. you? Yeah. So, what's next for Stahelski? At the time of recording, The Matrix Resurrections is set to release towards the end of 2021 with Stahelski rumoured to have consulted on the action for the movie. John Wick 4 is in production with a 2022 release date and a very exciting cast list. A Ghost of Tsushima movie adaptation has been announced, with Stahelski attached to direct. And perhaps most interestingly, Stahelski and the 8711 team have been developing a Highlander reboot for a number of years which Stahelski himself has promised will happen someday. Whatever is next for Stahelski, I'm sure it will no doubt please the action-loving audience. If you've enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe and comment, and I'll see you next time.